This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. We're bringing you the latest updates on the coronavirus outbreak. Libyan rivals are ready to talk, but will they agree to face-to-face -face negotiations? And we highlight the plight of refugees in Burkina Faso, where violence has displaced thousands from their homes. Hello and welcome to Africa Live on CGTN. I'm Lindy Mtongana in Nairobi. And with me in studio is Ucha Okoronkwo with a preview of your business news. Thank you, Lindy. And here's a look at what's coming up on Africa Live Bit. Qatar Airways launches a bid for a 49% stake in Rwanda Air. And the U.S. agrees to return $300 million looted by Nigeria's former military ruler. Of course, all that coming up within the program. But now, back to you, Lindy. Thanks, Buche. In our top story, the number of people infected by the coronavirus is growing by the thousands. Nearly 4,000 new cases were confirmed today in China, bringing the total number to more than 24,000, half of which are in Hubei province, the epicenter of the outbreak. The death toll now stands at 493, but over 1,000 people have been cleared of the virus nationwide. Suspected cases have dropped for two days in a row. The virus, though, has spread to 24 other countries, with a total of 196 confirmed cases. Well, indeed, more cases continue emerging, now even among infants, as doctors rush to find a treatment. A children's hospital in Wuhan says two newborn babies have tested positive for the coronavirus. One of the babies was born yesterday. Meanwhile, the Wuhan Institute of Virology says it's applied for a patent on the experimental drug Remdesivir to be used to treat coronavirus. And Leishan Shan, one of the two temporary new hospitals being built in Wuhan, is set to be completed today. Well, following the news of uh, uh, newborn babies testing positive for the coronavirus, we spoke to Professor Jonas schmidt chanasitz a little earlier. He is with the Bernard Nocht Institute for Tropical Medicine in Hamburg in Germany. And uh, he started by telling us how this virus can be transmitted during pregnancy. This is not an unexpected event. So we know from other viruses that they can be transmitted from the mother to the newborn, for example. This is very... Uh, a common or how to say in um, a complication in, in the seasonal flu and uh, everybody is aware of this. So uh, if this happened also for the new coronavirus, um, we have to take measures to prevent the transmission of the coronavirus to the newborn. As we know from influenza, uh, so the seasonal flu, it might cause very severe infections uh, in the newborn because they are very vulnerable. So uh, we have to to take measures that uh, uh, the new coronavirus may not be transmitted to the newborn. Chinese health officials say they've updated a diagnosis and treatment plan for the virus. They say it is the fifth version of the proposal, which was presented at a press conference earlier today. Compared with the fourth one, we have the uh, mild patients, common patients, severe patients, and the critical patients, totally four categories. That's to increase our classification or category-based uh, supervision for the treatment. Officials at that press conference added the fifth revision is based on a combination of traditional Chinese medicine and Western drugs. Uh, they say it focuses on proper diagnosis and treatment of critical cases in order to reduce the mortality rate. Authorities add that most of the asymptomatic uh, cases so far are people who have had close contact with confirmed cases. Wuhan officials say 14 medical workers who were infected at the start of the outbreak have since recovered. Five have been discharged. They contracted the virus while treating one infected patient at Wuhan's Xiehe Hospital. Their case is said to have been used as primary evidence in confirming human-to-human -human transmission of the novel coronavirus. 
Well, efforts are being made to ensure that there are enough beds for coronavirus patients in Wuhan. Lei Shenshan Hospital, a second temporary hospital built to combat the epidemic, will soon be completed at a record speed. CGTN reporter Zhao Yunfei has more from Wuhan. They're reaching a very critical time in order to not to disturb the workers from constructing and competing with the hours. Uh, the construction official has rejected all the media inquiries for today, but CGTN is the only press that got.
uh, intensify the fight against the coronavirus. Here in Kenya, a group of employees have come together to make donations to boost the fight. Kenyan staff at the Africa Star Railway Operation are raising funds in solidarity with their Chinese colleagues. CGTN's Wilkista Nyabwa was there and filed this report. A steady stream of employees wound their way toward the donation box at the center of the lobby area. The white envelopes held their donations. In their own little way, these employees of the Africa Star Railway Operation Company in Nairobi were supporting the fight against the coronavirus. The first cases of the new coronavirus were reported in China late in 2019. As the cases increased, Afrista employees in Nairobi decided to chip in in support of their Chinese colleagues. We are basically family when we work with them, and when family is in need, we jump up to help. Since the outbreak, our staff has been very concerned and have been thinking about how to help. We are focusing on ensuring our operations continue and ensuring the safety of our operations. We are grateful for the Kenyan donations, which show that we are one integrated family. Staff members who recently visited China and toured the affected Wuhan region remembered their time there. It hurts my heart because uh, when I was in Wuhan, I felt comfortable. I felt as if I was home, away from home. So I felt bad to, to realize that the people I interacted with are under this risk of contracting this virus. Like for example, last year, the Ministry of uh, Business sponsored a training that uh, has trained over 50 staff from here to go to China. And one of the places we went was Wuhan to train about really operation and management. So we really feel obliged to give back as a sign of kindness and a sign of appreciation. Employees gave cash donations which will be sent to the Red Cross and other organizations to boost the fight against the disease. Though the virus has not spread to Kenya, the company has already taken precautions to safeguard the 4,000 passengers it transports daily. We have also uh, requested our staff and give them, given them advice on ways to keep away and to ensure that they do not get the coronavirus. And we are also doing this to the passengers that we are carrying in the trains to ensure that we are safe all along. As scientists continue to work to contain the virus and to find a vaccine and a cure, the donation box remains in the lobby. Every donation counts. Through their donations, members of staff of the Afrista Railway Operation Company are sending a message of support to those fighting the coronavirus and hoping that their donations will make a great difference in this fight. Wilkis Anyabwa, CGTN, in Siokimau, Kenya. Meanwhile, Somalia has expressed solidarity with China as it battles the coronavirus epidemic. Health officials in Somalia say they've placed all ports of entry on high alert to contain the spread of the virus. CGTN's Abdulaziz Bilo has more from Mogadishu. A heightened response has been put in place at Mogadishu's Aden Abdullah, the biggest airport in Somalia over the coronavirus concerns. Health officials say the measure has been enforced at all ports of entry with passengers subjected to screening before being allowed to enter the country. We are jointly working on monitoring and identifying any potential threats with the relevant ministries of health, civil aviation as well as our immigration department. We have increased and continue to increase the capacity of our health officials at all ports of entry. The Somali government says its focus is international airlines coming in from several Middle Eastern and African countries. Airports and the regional administrations have also been urged to create emergency response centers to report any suspected cases. We have increased a lot at all major ports of entry, our security forces, immigration officials and airport management. We will enact a series of procedures that must be followed by all airlines and passengers to contain the ongoing threat. Somalia has not recorded any cases so far, but vows to ensure that all incoming flights are properly checked to prevent individuals carrying the virus from entering the country. Meanwhile, the Somali mission in China says that all 50 Somali citizens residing in Wuhan, the epicenter of the virus, are all in good condition, with none of them affected by the coronavirus.
On Monday, Somalia's Foreign Affairs Minister Ahmed Isa Awad hosted the Chinese ambassador to Somalia, Xinjiang, at his residence. Awad also assured the ambassador of his country's solidarity with China as it confronts the coronavirus. Abdul Aziz below CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. You're watching Africa Live. Let's take a short break. Here's what's still ahead on the program. Libyan rivals are ready to talk, but will they agree to face-to-face -to -face negotiations? And we highlight the plight of refugees in Burkina Faso, where violence has displaced thousands from their homes. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. You've got to get out, go there, and you'll find them. In the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo. Who come to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. Along the waters of the Nile. Along the sands of the Sahara. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. Right, we start in Burkina Faso now, where 13 people have been killed in a fresh attack in Pensa village, some 200 kilometers north of the capital city, Ouagadougou. The attack comes just as the Commissioner of the United Nations High Commission for Refugees wrapped up his visit of the Sahel region to assess the magnitude of the humanitarian crisis caused by militant attacks across the region. Now, according to security sources, the security situation in the area is swiftly deteriorating. At least 18 civilians were killed on Monday after unidentified gunmen launched an attack in the northern part of the country. And on Saturday, heavily armed men on motorbikes attacked Lamdamal village just north of the capital. Well, let's bring you more on this now. We're joined by CGTN's Panina Karibe, who is live with us in Kaya in Burkina Faso. Uh, Panina, yet another attack in Burkina Faso. What more do we know about this incident uh, that's left 13 people dead? Well, Lindy, what we know at the moment is this attack happened during the day yesterday at 11 in the morning. A very brief attack, we are told. It lasted approximately 15 minutes. And from what we understand, what happened was uh, armed groups or armed people came riding motorcycles. Each motorcycle had about three people, and they sprayed bullets on an entire village, that Pensa village. Uh, that 15 minutes at the end of that ordeal, 12 people were lying dead on the ground, Lindy. So everybody took off. Uh, that's about 150 kilometers from where we are now, which is Kaya Town. And so as you would imagine, these people are they're, they're really cut off. There's no proper means of transportation. So we understand that a lot of them are still on the way coming here. Now, if you look behind me, I'm sure you can be able to see what's happening. This has now turned into a makeshift displacement camps for some of the people who managed to get some transportation and come here with their children. Now, we've spoken to the mayor of that area, and he told us that today morning he did come to Kaya to speak to the military, and he had to ask them to go back to that village and collect the corpses of the 12 people that they had confirmed at that time had died. It's a very volatile situation, Lindy. They're saying these attacks have been indiscriminate. Previously, they would choose the men and kill them. But now, starting the 31st of January, uh, they've been talking to us and saying they've seen a change of tactic. They've been killing everybody from women and even children, Lindy. It really is a frightening situation for the people that live there. And as you mentioned, Penina, you're standing in a makeshift camp. This really highlights how difficult the humanitarian situation must be on the ground. Is there enough assistance been given to these displaced people? 
frankly, Lindy, from what I have seen, I would say no. I mean, when you look at this place, this wasn't even, uh, uh, it hadn't really been earmarked to be a displacement camp. We got here planning to do a completely different story. And then we just got the news that this attack had happened and the town was just learning about that attack. UNHCR was just learning about it. And so we first started seeing the first few people arriving here. This, where we are standing right now, this is somebody's private parcel of land. And he actually came from Cote d'Ivoire. He had planned to put up a private school here. Then he got the news that his family in Pensa Village had been attacked. And naturally, you would expect that his heart would actually break for his family and even the people that he knows. And so he has uh, given this piece of land temporarily to those coming in from that village. There is no sanitation, no water, no toilets. He's just brought in uh, some, some several liters of water, really, for the people to use overnight. Now, when we got, we came along with UNHCR uh, people, and they were just starting to register them so that we could be able to then know what it is they need and in what numbers. But yesterday, we spoke to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi. Uh, he just had wrapped up his tour of this region. And just take a listen to how he summarized the humanitarian situation, especially here in Burkina Faso. We have here a very urgent humanitarian emergency, especially here in Burkina Faso. This is a country that at the beginning of uh, 2019, a year ago, had a few thousand internally displaced people. We're now close to 600,000 at the latest count in uh, December. I am persuaded there's many more. And uh, I was in uh, Kaya, in Dore, in places that are receiving these internally displaced. The local community are overwhelmed by having to accommodate in their rather simple homes and uh, neighborhoods uh, thousands of additional people. There's no water. Uh, sanitation is a big problem. These are urban centers. Uh, shelter is another very important need. Uh, food, uh, health, access to schools, kids go, do, go to school. It's, it's a very, it's a very, it's a fully fledged emergency situation. And this uh, humanitarian situation shows no sign of abating. Of course, Panina, it's fueled by this insecurity and by this violence. Uh, you mentioned that there's been a change of tactic, that these killings have become increasingly indiscriminate, killing men, women and children. How then, Panina, are security forces responding to these attacks? We posed that question, Lindy, to those who've just arrived here and to the mayor of that village that was just attacked. And what he said was, it's been a very challenging task for the security personnel. And the single most reason for that he gave was because this is a very huge uh, land, really, with very p few people, villages scattered across huge swathes of land. There are some few police stations that have been set up to secure these areas, but they're just simply overwhelmed. And then again, there's also what I mentioned, that uh, tactic of just ambush attacks, a, 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 an attack that just lasts 15 minutes. And that would happen perhaps in the village that's about uh, 30 kilometers, say, for, for instance, from where we are. We understand that roads are in terrible condition. So for those police officers and the military to be able to promptly uh, know where these attacks are going to happen or even to respond when they get the distress calls from villages is really a difficult task for them. So that's the single biggest challenge that security authorities here are facing, Lindy. It is a very difficult challenge indeed. Thank you so much. Panina Karibe uh, joining us there from a town called Kaya in Burkina Faso. Well, staying with uh, Panina's coverage of the situation in Burkina Faso, let's take a look at uh, this story now. Panina visited a refugee camp near the border with Mali and found this report. Gudubu refugee camp is home to more than 8,000 Malians. It is one of only two Malian refugee camps in Burkina Faso, and it is here that they thought they would find a safe haven away from home. Al-Hassan is among thousands of Malian refugees who are presently in Burkina Faso. He's been here with his family for about eight years, and in those eight years, they've suffered double displacement. Al-Hassan, talk to us about your journey. We left Mali in 2012 when insecurity broke out. All around us, our neighbors were attacked and houses were burnt down. So I decided to move with my family to Burkina Faso. 
At the time, he had three young children, the eldest only seven years old. After walking for a week, they finally reached Mentau refugee camp in Burkina Faso. By the time we arrived, the children were sick due to the long journey and the harsh weather conditions. They were also very weak because they had not been eating properly. As security in Mali deteriorated, more and more Malians fled to Burkina Faso. The camp where Al Hassan was registered, Mentao, presently hosts more than 6,000 Malian refugees. It has now become a prime target for militants and a death trap for the refugees. To be honest, it is a challenge. It's a, a situation because they, have, they, they run away from their country because of insecurity. Now they are facing the same situation in the country of asylum, which is a, a, a terrible situation. Mainly, I can even talk about those of Mentao, who are really in the battlefield, if I can call it. They are really in the battlefield. They can't move out too much because around they are surrounded by armed people. As a result, Al Hassan fled again, this time to Kudubo refugee camp. But even here, safety is not assured. That camp itself has been attacked three times. In April, in November and in December. Three attacks by unknown armed groups attacking the forces at the, the one indeed protecting the camp. Securi the, 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 those are forces are there to, say, to, to assure security of the refugees and themselves have been attacked. Despite those attacks, Al Hassan's family, perhaps left with nowhere else to run to, insists they will brave it out. I would rather stay here. At least here, I don't see what I saw in Monato refugee camp. There were dead bodies everywhere. From time to time, we would hear gunshots. We had no access to hospitals, and our children couldn't go to school. Here we have all those amenities. The attacks, however, have become more and more brazen. Here, in Gudubo camp, aid agencies can only stay up to 2 p.m. due to insecurity. The Burkina Faso government has provided security personnel to secure the camp in a desperate attempt to fight back against the militants. Still, security remains a huge concern for the refugees and presents a huge challenge for humanitarian agencies to access them. Penina Karibe, CGTN, in Dori, Burkina Faso. Right, let's turn our attention to news from Malawi now. The African Union says it acknowledges the decision of the Constitutional Court of Malawi to annul the May 2019 presidential elections that gave victory to Peter Mutharika. Meanwhile, the Southern African Development Community, or SADC, is urging for peace and calm as the electoral body prepares for fresh elections in just 150 days. The court's decision annulled the elections in which Mutharika won and has ordered a rerun. CGTN's Coletta Wanjoy explains. After the May 2019 presidential elections in Malawi, the African Union's preliminary report said that the process had been largely peaceful and that it had not noted any serious concerns with the whole process. And six months later, the judiciary in Malawi ruled that the integrity of the result was severely compromised. The African Union, through its Southern African Development Community Bloc, SADC, is praising the constitution of Malawi for upholding the constitution of the country and the electoral law in the conduct of the petition. The African Union says the people of Malawi have shown faith in the judiciary and respect for the rule of law. The chairperson of the Southern Regional Bloc, who is also the president of Zimbabwe, Emerson Munangangwa, says the bloc will support Malawi in the election process as guided by the principles of democratic process. Koleto Anjohi, CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And let's now go to Uche for your latest business news. Thanks, Lindy. And coming up on Africa Live Biz. Qatar Airways launches a bid for a 49% stake in Rwanda Air. And the U.S. agrees to return $300 million looted by Nigeria's former military ruler. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. 
All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Well, Qatar Airways is in talks to buy a 49% stake in Africa's Rwanda Air. The state-run carrier is also interested in doubling its holding in Latam Airlines Group to 20%. Now, Qatar Airways Chief Executive Akbar al bakir said a stake in an African airline will widen its reach in one of the world's fastest-growing aviation sectors. Qatar is looking for options to bypass restrictions imposed on it by some Arab states. Uh, the airline did uh, buy some new stakes in other airlines. This is after once lucrative markets like the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia banned it from its airspace. That's following a regional political dispute. The Middle East airline has been forced to fly longer routes to avoid the blocked airspace. Qatar Airways already owns stakes in British Airways, parent International Airlines Group, China Southern, Cathay Pacific and Latam. The airline has also expressed interest in taking a stake in India's Indigo and Morocco's Royal Air Maroc. Now, the U.S. and Nigeria have reached an agreement to repatriate around 308 million U.S. dollars, which was seized from Nigeria's former military ruler, Sani Abacha. The deal is backed by the island of Jersey. U.S. prosecutors say the sum is the latest to be recovered from the accounts of Abacha. The Nigerian government did peg the total amount at about $321 million. Now, the funds were laundered through the U.S. banking system and then held in a bank uh, account in Jersey. Sani Abacha ruled Nigeria from about 1993 until his death in 1998. Companies linked to the Abacha family have gone to court to prevent the repatriation. They claim the process is an infringement of their rights to a fair trial. Secretary of State Michael Pompeo also expressed hope that the United States will be able to lift visa restrictions that were slapped on Nigeria last week. And the World Bank plans to revise downward its 2020 global growth forecasts on concerns that the ongoing outbreak in China will harm international supply chains. That's according to World Bank President David Malpass. The World Bank last month forecast a rebound in 2020 after the easing of trade tensions between Washington and Beijing. But Malpass warned that the virus that has killed hundreds in China and closed businesses and borders also poses a threat to global growth. Now, Malpass said the lender's forecast would be lowered for at least the first part of 2020 due to the virus and threats to global supply chains. Meanwhile, in Tanzania, the government has given microfinanced institutions operating in the country one year to align their processes with newly approved microfinance regulations. The new regulations, which were approved in November last year, aim to stop unfair practices on debt repayment from citizens. CGTN's Daniel Kijo with more. Tanzania's finance minister, Philip Mpango, is urging the central bank of Tanzania to pay close attention to financial service companies preferred by people with low income. He says the firm should face stern action when found to have broken the law. He has now given them one year to comply. According to the new regulations issued by the central bank, anyone that intends to offer microfinance must first pay a non-refundable application fee of $220. To operate as an individual lender, it's $130. Companies also need operating guidelines as well as properly defined complaint handling and dispute resolution procedures. Microfinance service providers must also operate in an open and fair manner. They are required to make sure the terms of loans and their services are clearly communicated and understood by borrowers. For those looking to run a savings and credit cooperative society popularly known as SACOSES, they are required at all times to have a capital of $4,500 for individual lenders and a capital of $86,000 for companies. Lenders can't sell any property retained as security until at least 60 days after a payment notice is sent to a borrower who is in default. Daniel Kijo, CGTN, Dar es Salaam. 
Now, with Egypt's massive urban expansion, tens of thousands of houses are built every year. Economically, that translates into a boost for a lot of supporting industries in the country. But a government plan to replace millions of utility meters has created a challenge. To address uh, the meter shortages, uh, the government has now summoned its military production arm. Here's Adele El Marui with more. Egypt is moving to replace 30 million traditional electric meters across the country. The government also wants all houses in its new urban cities to have smart electricity, water and natural gas meters. That sudden spike in demand created a gap in the market. Believing in the reliability of its military industrial power, Factory 45 has been entrusted to boost local production of these much needed devices. The demand in the Egyptian market recently has been phenomenal. It can easily accommodate the supply of both the private and the public sectors. The military production factories are here to fill in the gap and not to compete against the private sector. This factory is a little over a year old. In that short period, it has built up the capacity to produce up to 2.5 million meters annually. And that couldn't have been achieved without the Chinese technology introduced in investments worth 4.3 million US dollars. We have a huge cooperation with China, including some of the biggest multinational companies like Huawei. It is our partner in the pilot launch for the smart utility meters. Huawei is sharing about 40,000 meters. We assemble and test them in the factory, and so far it is a great success. Factory 45 also produces water meters, which use advanced components to decrease water waste. The government has installed some 400,000 of these meters in its buildings, saving 28% in water consumption. Egypt has decided to install them in all public schools, hospitals and mosques by the year 2030. All meters from the military factory are 25% cheaper. The domestic components started at 40%, Today it reached 65 and the factory aims to make it 85% by the end of the year. The relative success of Factory 45 in water and electric meters has encouraged the government to move faster in replacing all traditional meters in the country. Soon the factory will launch a new production line for prepaid natural gas meters. Adel Mahrui, CGTN, Cairo. Well, shifting focus now, more and more British parents are ditching disposable diapers, choosing reusable ones instead. Three factors are believed to be behind the trend. That's the growing awareness for the environment, fashionable designer prints, as well as saving money. Here's CGTN's Kuchia with more. Get a bear and bow. Yeah, which uh, one? A uh, hibiscus I'm going to need and a yeah. sunflower. Forget the bulky cloth divers of old. The new breed of reusable nappies is flashy and fashionable. In limited edition designer prints, this is just a small selection of some of the most sought after reusable nappies available on the market. This is the warehouse of the nappy lady, Wendy Richards. She's an online retailer and a reusable nappy guru. You've got so many beautiful prints and that, that's kind of come out in the last sort of four or five years. It's kind of gone from the very plain just whites or maybe you might have a blue or a pink one in there. Now the manufacturers are kind of following trends. So llamas are very uh, fashionable at the moment. Avocados are the new thing that's coming out. And almost what you see trends on parents' clothes, you're now seeing on their nappies. So parents are kind of making it as part of their clothing. It's good business. Ten years ago, what she was turning over in a year, she's now turning over each month. The nappy lady provides a questionnaire and free consultation to help parents find the right reusable product for their babies. We've got parents sitting up, they're, they're waiting for me to launch them. They know what day we're going to have got the delivery and what time we're going to launch. And they're sitting on the website at four in the morning, just waiting for them to go live. She recently sold 300 Mother Ease nappies in just 30 seconds. If the fashionable prints are what hooks the parents into using reusable nappies for the long term, environmental guilt is what is driving them to ditch the disposables in the first place. 
According to the Environment Agency, the UK throws away 8 million disposable nappies every day. And the average baby wearing disposables will get through 4,000 on average before they are potty trained. The hardest thing, um, teaching the husband how to wash them correctly, um, he, he means well. One of the unique things about the reusable nappy world is the community it supports. In most towns and cities in the country, there is a nappy library. It works the same way as a book library. You come in, you borrow uh, some nappies to try. It gives you a, we give you a, a variety of brands and uh, styles. You take them home, have a go, and, uh, and then bring them back to me. But there's a lot more to a nappy library than just borrowing nappies. It's a place for new parents to meet and discuss the challenges as well as pleasures of reusable diapers. Mainly environmentally conscious, trying to do our bit and the amount of nappies we go through and I kind of look at the bag at the end of the day and just think it's all going into landfill. According to the Life Circle Assessment for Disposable and Reusable Nappies, the Environment Agency, a switch from disposables to reusables is 40 percent better for the planet. And certainly, these babies are sitting pretty, looking to a cleaner future. CGTN. Well, that's all for now in Africa Live Biz, but ahead on Global Business Africa, Ghana sells the longest dated Eurobond ever issued by a sub-Saharan African government. We'll bring you more on that at the top of the hour. For now, back to you, Lindy. Thanks, Richard. Well, let's take a short break. Here's what's coming up uh, after the break. An invention by a Nigerian mother helps tackle jaundice in infants. The greatest journeys, the greatest sights, the greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ugh. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. A Nigerian mother has made it her life's mission to tackle neonatal jaundice. Virtue Oboro invented Nigeria's first lightweight phototherapy crib using LED lights. Let's take a look. My name is Virtue Oboro. I am the founder of Tiny Hearts Technology. And the Virtue Oboro watched her baby suffer for hours from jaundice in the hospital. The ordeal inspired her to start her business, Tiny Hearts Technology. She provides lightweight therapy units fitted with LED lighting to hospitals in Nigeria. The light is actually what makes the crib a phototherapy unit. Her son Tombra was born in 2015 with jaundice, a potentially fatal condition. It's caused when the liver is too slow to clear bilirubin. High intensity light is used to break down the compound. But at the hospital in the southern town of Yenagoa, none of the phototherapy units were available. When her son was finally placed in one, he was burned by the fluorescent lighting. So she created Crib Aglow, using cooler LED lights, which prevent babies from getting burned or dehydrated. The perception that a lot of doctors and nurses and you know, medical experts had was, this is not good, it didn't come from one of us. You, know, you have to be an expert in this field to come up with something like this. But fortunately for us, we worked we had a strong team that helped put this together. Today, the cribs have, according to Oboro, found their way to 70 hospitals around Nigeria and Ghana. It's very, very convenient. 
which is very mobile. You can move around and I think it's also very simple to use. The first month of a child's life is considered to carry the highest risk of death. And Nigeria has a second highest rate of neonatal deaths in the world. And to Togo now, where the seventh edition of the International Fashion Festival, known as FIMO 228, has been held in the capital, Lomé. The festival, which is part of the Week of African Haute Couture, aims to support African stylists while promoting the fight against HIV-AIDS. A total of 28 designers from four African and European countries took part. We made young creators aware of the scourge of HIV AIDS. In a way, fashion engages the society to fight against HIV AIDS. I think the evening went very well, but I prefer to leave it to others to judge. I take this opportunity to ask people of the goodwill to support fashion in our countries. In English-speaking countries, for example, fashion is progressing very well, especially thanks to the help of the patrons. But with us, there's still a lot of work to be done to boost the fashion world. Indeed, many talents, unfortunately, lack of the support to emerge. I am at my first participation and I leave satisfied with this 7th edition of the International Fashion Festival. With what I have just seen, I will not miss the next editions. The fashion designer and pattern maker have done a magnificent job. And coming up in your sports news, up next.